Robert Wright. He says, you know, my name is uh, Bob McMillan. My students actually, I, I tell them to call me Robert McMillan, and, and uh, it's mostly because um, uh, my kids from school, they go, Dad, you know, um, whenever they give a, a, an example of who the stupid guy is, they always use the name Bob, you know. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that is so great. I thought the name Bob was never going to go out of style, but apparently it is now the example for that. So, uh, so when I put my name up on the board, I now say Robert McMillan. So you might hear the students uh, refer to me that way. But um, just a fun little fact. When I uh, had my uh, consulting company, um, did you have a question? Yes, behind you it says July 1st, Chris White. Why didn't you put your name up there? Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> I've got to get this done. <laughs> videos for uh, quite a while. I had my a company called Alltech One, and I sold that in 2017. And, um, uh, you know, I've been teaching here since uh, 2011 in the Microsoft uh, server space. And I just want to show you sort of the evolution of, of how I got here. First off, how many people uh, have used Camtasia so far? Oh, that's great. Okay, so how, well, I'll be, I should say the other one. How many have not? Okay, so we're about half and half. Okay. Um, so, so for some of you, this is going to be a new, brand new experience, and others not so much. So let's talk about the evolution. So I started out in uh, 2010 doing YouTube videos, and at that time, YouTube had uh, started talking about uh, this program where they were going to start sharing the ad revenue with people. So I thought, wow, this is an interesting idea. So I made a, you know, five, ten videos, something like that, and uh, after about six months. Um, Google got back to me and said, hey, would you like to be part of this program? So you had to be invited. You, could, you can't just get into it. And uh, how many of you are interested in, in getting into uh, having your own YouTube channel? Okay, all right. So definitely going to help you out. Um, so after uh, uh, I got into the program, about three months into it, um, I said I made my first three cents. I'm like, cool. I now understand how this is going to work. So what I did was I spent every night, every weekend, you know, after coming back from the office, and uh, just making, cranking out videos on Windows how-to videos, on servers, and workstations, things like that. I'm now up to over 3,000 videos. And uh, so I get about 20,000 hits a day, and it's over 25 million hits right now. <laughs> so in 2015, um, if you do a good enough job, <laughs> this is what could happen for you. So in 2015, uh, lynda.com, which is now LinkedIn Learning, so they've just rebranded themselves, so they're no longer going to be a lynda.com. They said, hey, would you be interested in making you know, videos for us on uh, Windows certifications and some other things as well? So I said, I, I, you know, that, that sounds interesting. So they flew me down to um, Santa Barbara, actually to this town right next to it called Carpinteria. I don't know if you guys have ever, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but um, anybody know how to say that or have been down there before? It's a really cool place. They have this um, beach where it oozes out tar, and uh, apparently the Native Americans used to um, use that to, you know, for pitch and, and things like that. But it's really weird to go out onto the beach and see, you know, just tar just oozing everywhere. <laughs> it's it's mostly hard, but it's you know you can heat it up. Anyway, um, so I made uh, videos for them, and uh, it it went really well. And I said, you know what, I've got my own setup at home. Do you mind if I just uh, you know, record from home? They said, sure, we have some authors that do that. And so they sent me the gear I needed, which was a special headset and, and a mixing board and things like that. So I started you know, recording from them as well. Uh, then after that, Pluralsight, which is another company, they just went public last year. Uh, they contacted me and said, would you be interested in, in making different kinds of videos? So I said, sure, let's do that. And then Microsoft actually called me this past, uh, well, about six months ago, and I did my first live webinar for them. Uh, it was really unusual. I was sitting at my desk at home, in front of my computer, giving a Visio demonstration, and I had no idea who was on the other end. There was hundreds of people, actually, I found out later, 
uh, that were watching my demonstration, but I had no way of knowing what was going on. So I was just cruising along, doing my, <laughs> my tutorial, and uh, so at the end, they started uh, popping in questions into this little feed that they set up, and so I started answering the questions for them. And uh, it went really well. So people can actually watch that you know, tutorial afterwards, you know, recorded, um, just like what we're doing today. And uh, so that was, that was quite the experience. So uh, I'm just going to exit out of this for a second and just show you um, what the, you know, there we go, Linda. <laughs> so these are some of the courses that I've done. Uh, we've got Exchange Server. Done a lot of those, high availability, storage services, done a lot of system center configuration <coughs> manager, and other system center programs, uh, and things like that. Um, the, uh, I've had about a million hits altogether. My biggest one right here is the learning system center configuration manager I did uh, a couple of years back. So this is what it looks like. You know, I've got about 20 courses on there uh, right now. Anybody have any questions so far? Are you making lots of money at it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and you know, it's it's been it's been great. It's not uh, teaching fulfilling, uh, but it's um, because I don't get that you know student interaction that I, that we get here. Uh, you don't get to see the light bulb go over people's heads. You know that kind of satisfaction you know, when you when you, you know, teach somebody. But um, uh, it, it is, you know, an enjoyable, you know, type of thing. I do a ton of research. Uh, my first course took about 60 hours, and then after that, um, I got it down to about 20 to 30 hours. Um, so I could definitely do it a lot more efficiently than, than I used to. Uh, but because you asked that question, Scott, you get a piece of candy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you got another piece of candy. There you go. <laughs> and I got a whole bag of candy, so ask lots of good questions. All right. So uh, that was, was my experience there. Oops. Put the wrong button there. All right. So here's my recording setup uh, at home, uh, and uh, I've got a server server cabinet <laughs> filled with. Equipment, soundboard, things like that. I've uh, got a few monitors there, and uh, you'd be surprised how you know many monitors you you actually need for these kinds of things. Uh, I could use a couple of more, you know, uh, because there's so many different things uh, you know going on there. Um, I also have uh, rented a um, a cage at a data center where I have uh, servers that have uh, 680 gigabytes of RAM and 30 terabytes of storage. And the reason for that is because although uh, LinkedIn Learning and all these companies, they say, hey, would you do these courses? They don't provide the hardware to do them. And for instance, Exchange Server alone requires 128 gigabytes of RAM to run properly. <laughs> so uh, you know, I had to uh, basically come up with my own equipment to, uh, to do this you know, the right way. But you don't have to have this kind of a crazy setup. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this for just a few hundred bucks and still get really decent quality. Like I said, the only reason I did this much is because you know, the servers that I have to demonstrate have to have huge horsepower. But you guys may not all need that. Any questions about any of that? Maybe you missed out these candy. Uh, all right. So uh, when Scott sent out that email, um, the feedback that I generally got was, uh, people wanted to learn about YouTube, which I thought was really interesting. I thought, you know, uh, Camtasia was going to be the bigger draw here, but um, people were more interested in, uh, because of the fact that the screencast program is, is not super great, that we have, you know, can post videos to. So um, what I've been doing is I've been posting my videos on YouTube, and then you take the commercials off of it. You know, so if you do get part of the affiliate program over time, uh, then you can take the commercials off of it. And then, um, uh, so for the ones that the students end up watching, uh, but then you can leave them on for you know all the other ones. Uh, so some people did say they're interested in Camtasia, so we'll definitely talk about that as well. And of course, implementing videos in our courses. So once we make these cool videos, we post them up on YouTube. Uh, then we need to make them available uh, to our students. One of the other nice things about YouTube is closed captioning. So they will automatically do closed captioning for you. Uh, it's not super great. It's better than it was a couple of years ago. 
but you may still end up having to, uh, you know, fix some of the closed captioning after they uh, set it up for you. And there's a there's a way that you can go in and edit the uh, the text that is automatically there. It does take a, a couple of months sometimes for the closed captioning to show up. Um, so after you post your video, it won't uh, show up right away. There was a period of time, um, Scott can probably uh, recall this, where we were required to do closed captioning. Then they took that requirement off. But I think it really is you know, great for the students who need it uh, to be able to have, have that there. So if you do post it up on YouTube, then you will be able to, uh, to see that. <coughs> so at, uh, when I went to uh, Santa Barbara LinkedIn headquarters, I learned a lot of uh, really useful stuff. And I learned more in my first week uh, while I was you know, sitting there recording than I learned in the previous five years of uh, recording. They really did um, help out a lot in, in uh, specific areas to keep students engaged. So this is the uh, studios uh, that we recorded, or recorded. Now, that's not me in there. <laughs> and, uh, the, so what, the, what you do is you go in to these booths, and on this side is the uh, producer, and on, or editor, or whatever you want to call it. On the other side is you. And so uh, there's a glass, you know, between the two. So basically, while I was recording, uh, this person was staring at me the whole week. And so that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to go back to record there. <laughs> Even though they took really good care of us, they like, gave uh, $75 a day to go eat wherever you wanted and, and treated, treated us like kings. So it, it was really a nice uh, you know, setup there. But being, you know, not having to fly down there every time I want to do the course was kind of nice as well. So here are the best practices that uh, I want to tell you about. And the first one is, don't move around the map. So when you're recording, don't do a lot of this. See how distracting that is? Um, so a lot of people do the when they want to focus on something. You want to use something else called callouts, which I'll show you how to do in a little bit. So keep the mouse just still. Just don't even bother moving it except for if you have to go click on a box. But never use it to point out to something. Don't capitalize everything. So you see, this is the, the general accepted practice here, is you capitalize the first word, but then don't capitalize anything after it. Um, unless it's, of course, a proper name, that kind of thing. <coughs> don't use periods in your slide presentations. Uh, so you can use commas, but you don't have to put periods at the end of them. Don't know why this is a standard, but this is the standard. Any questions so far? Yeah. You can actually hide the, the mouse you know, when you're capturing the video. That's a good point. Yes, there is uh, an option in there to hide the mouse. And since you're hiding the mouse, you get a mouse pad. Oh. So here you go. All right. I have a lot of, I went to a lot of trade shows. I got a lot of stuff. Like <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Slides should have big letters. See how easy that is to see? Now, a slide presentation for your class does not have to match a slide presentation for your video recordings. So um, what I'm showing you here isn't necessarily what you need to do for your classroom. This is more about um, presenting it in, in, in a video. And the reason is because more than 50%, and I can actually see this in my YouTube statistics, more than 50% of our viewers are now watching these on mobile devices. So if you have small letters, if you have a lot of words, they're not going to be able to see them. A lot of people are, are, are studying while they're on trains or in buses. You know, they're, uh, they're in places where they, you know, regular computer just doesn't make sense. And this is uh, what you want to do. If you're going to be doing a command prompt, uh, if you're going to be showing code, I know a lot of you guys you know, are, are programmers. So if you're going to be doing that, then the command prompt should be at least 20 point font. Um, so basically, you know, when you go into this guy, you guys all know how to do this, but uh, you want to fill the screen as well. So you want it to be just like that, and then go down here and font and change it to at least 20 points. If you, if you can get away with bigger because you don't have you know, really long commands, go bigger. Go as big as you possibly can without having the commands go on to the next line. You want to keep your commands on. Now that's kind of impossible with some PowerShell commands and things like that, and probably some of the stuff that Mark does. But uh, if you can do it, great. If you can't, you know, they'll, they'll understand as long as you have nice big letters. 
<laughs> Alright, no more than three main points per slide. Uh, again, this may not be the same for your classes, but it's definitely for videos. You want to make sure no more than three main points per slide. And that's really to keep people from shutting down. You don't want them to you know, uh, be distracted from whatever, whatever it is that you're teaching them. It's almost like when uh, your boss calls you in to, uh, to yell at you. You know, the general HR rule, you know, you know, I, I, I took an HR class once, and uh, uh, is you never tell them more than three bad things at a time. <laughs> Same kind of thing with uh, this slide. Okay, so if I type in really small letters and put a lot of information, you know, the more, you, the more of this kind of stuff you do, the, the less that people are going to, to look at. So this is just a visual of that kind of thing. Because everything on this slide is no good. <laughs> so don't do that. Uh, edit out breaths and pauses. Uh, so for those of you who have used uh, screencast, do you tend to edit that stuff out? Or do you just sort of let it let it work? Okay. Uh, so in a, in a video in, in Camtasia, it's really simple to edit that kind of stuff out. And uh, you, you just don't want to, uh, it, it's amazing how, how short of a pause you can get before people will tune out. So you want to keep things moving. Almost like your, your classroom. You know, how many times have we been distracted by something and then it's impossible you know, for the next five minutes to get your, your students back into it, right? You gotta keep things going. So what I do, when I, whenever I make a mistake, is instead of re-recording everything or just leaving it in there, is I say rephrase. And so I look for these, um, as I'm listening back to the video when I'm going to do my editing, I, li I look for these rephrase uh, things that I mentioned. And then I know to cut the video, clean it up, tie it together, and then uh, I'll have a nice uh, video without any types of mistakes. Use high contrast. So for those of us uh, who are over 40, <laughs> this is really hard to see, right? But those people who are under 40 tend to do that a lot, like great text on white. I don't get it. Uh, it's very difficult, of course, in a mobile device, but it's also very difficult for you know, uh, people who, of, of a certain age who uh, just have a hard time you know, distinguishing those two. Yes? Did they talk about ADA, colorblindness? Specific colors and ways to emphasize? Uh, they, they did not um, teach us anything in, in that realm, um, but they just you know, definitely stay, you know, uh, stay on high contrast. So um, unfortunately, uh, yeah, LinkedIn Learning and, and some of the other ones, they don't really, you know, except for the closed captioning, they don't really go that, that deep into the ADA compliance. You know. okay. uh, uh, yeah. Just um, about mistakes. Uh -huh. Sometimes mistakes are good. I find. Okay. Because if, if you have a mistake, if you have no mistakes, then students believe that they should be able to program from start to finish without uh -huh. a mistake. Okay. Whereas if you have mistakes, sometimes I purposely put mistakes in there uh -huh. so that I can go back and fix them. Right. Because, you know, programming is something that you never get the very yeah. first time. And yeah. I found when I, when I edited out all my mistakes, that students felt like, oh, what's going on? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can't <laughs> do this for the very first time like you can. Right. So, so I, I think sometimes having planned mistakes in, your, in what you're teaching uh -huh. is, a good, is good. And, and, and that, that may be a great teaching type of a tool. But what I'm referring to more is are stumbling over words. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, or or your, uh, you know, sometimes I know I've, ty I've typed PowerShell commands and I've, I miss something and I get the big red letters and I'm like, oh, they didn't want to see that. <laughs> but if you use well, it as well, a teaching tool, maybe, it's maybe they do want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason why I'm saying maybe they yeah. do want to see that that they don't have to get it right the very first time. You, you, I mean, you I might, you might. I think it. it's yeah. not like if everything you type in is red letters. That's yeah. that's one thing. Yeah. But, but by making a mistake here or there and leaving it in your, your video, yeah. I think that that shows that that's what they're going to be doing. Um, and I don't know. So well, I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a really valid point. Absolutely yeah. valid point. Do you have a question? Yeah, the question about uh, rephrase. Do you mean that uh, you just attach that word and... I just say the word you know, rephrase. So I, I, go, re I go rephrase and then I do it again. Okay. So, so the takeaway from this is that 
when Dan makes a mistake, he did it on purpose. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. So it's not, yeah, it's not really a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not really a mistake. Oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions before we move on? Or comments? Yeah. <coughs> I have a drink cozy. Mm. <laughs> All right, so microphones. We should talk about that. But should I show myself in the video? I'm going to show you how to show yourself in the video. Um, maybe some of you were, were like, hey, you know, is that something I need to do? How do I do that? Well, pretty much everybody has nowadays a, a built in webcam with a laptop, or you can get a cheap um, you know, webcam that you can plug in you know, USB. So I definitely recommend that you show yourself, but you don't have to show yourself for the entire time. So uh, you can show yourself you know, in, the, in the big screen for maybe a few seconds just so they can make a connection with you, which is really difficult to do in an online class sometimes, and th that really helps in that. Or you can leave uh, your, yourself in the bottom corner uh, you know, while you're, you're doing the rest of the teaching as well for you know, the entire part of the video, but uh, you don't have to do that. But I do recommend that at least part of at least some of your videos that you do show yourself. Uh, so has anybody done that in their videos that they that they do? Some of you guys done that? Okay, very good. Uh, so when you go to record, I'm going to show you how to record in uh, both AVI and Trek. So uh, Trek is um, Camtasia's own type of format, and that allows you to to record that uh, camera feature as well. If you do it in AVI, it's just flat. It's there's no ability to input yourself or a second video source in there. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do both of those. You can decide which way you want. Because there are some times where you want to do API instead of track. And uh, so I'll show you that. All right, microphones. So a lot of you don't know <coughs> to me what's the best type of microphone to use. I don't recommend the one in your laptop. Because that is not good. <laughs> I also don't re recommend wireless devices. Uh, because they rely on radio signals, there's all kinds of background noise that happens in there. Sometimes you can filter some of it out, which is good, and I'll show you how to do that. But other times, um, it's just never going to be good enough quality. So my, my first year or so, I did a wireless mic, and even though it was a pretty high-end one, it was probably $100, you know, back in 2010, it just, I, it just never had the quality that a wired one. But you don't have to spend a lot of money either. Um, you can get a Blue Yeti, a Blue Ice. These are super popular with YouTube uh, people out there.